that happens, you're going to see the United States very isolated. I mean, talk about isolation in the last couple of years. That's been a pretty important theme of mine, how the U.S. will exert pressure, say, with Iran sanctions. And before you know it, a couple of European nations break away and say, well, we're going to continue dealing with Iran. Before you know it, you've got the United States making so many rules that no one wants to play with them anymore. They were isolated before World War I. They're going to be isolated again as the fascist nation. So what are the four nations? It's Germany, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Japan. Okay, in order, let's just follow this. Germany has significant technology. The Eurasian trade zone, let's just think it's, it's China and Russia and a lot of other nations. They're going to want the technology transfer from Germany. If you look at construction equipment in China, you see some Japanese, but you see a lot of German. I mean, that, that device that, that sucks up cement and drops it on the seventh floor, that sucking machine that deposits cement, that's German. They get the lock on that market. They have the lock on a lot of things. Obviously not cranes. A lot of countries make cranes. But we're going to see Germany important for investment capital. Watch Frankfurt explode as a, an RMB hub. Uh, that term is coming up a lot. It means renminbi hub. It means a hub for trading bonds and issuing bonds and converting currency from the Chinese yuan denomination. So it's the RMB hub. Watch a lot of the business connections with Russia and China. I think we're going to see uh, the importance of the 3,000 German companies doing question. If 3,000 German companies are doing business in Russia, will Germany follow through on a sanctions? <laughs> I mean, what a stupid concept. Germany is not going to follow through on any sanctions with Russia. 40% of the natural gas used by Germany comes from Russia. 30% of all the crude oil used in Germany comes from Russia. You think they're going to sanction their own energy suppliers? What a stupid concept. No, Germany already has strong commercial ties with Russia and extremely firm but newer ties with China. They're going to flip, and what I've been told is that Angela Merkel, even though she was just reelected, she's been told, you're on the way out. You just don't represent us anymore. You want to continue to sing in total harmony with the U.S., E.U., U.K., banker, cabal, then fine, because you don't sing in harmony with our corporate sector here in Germany. I've heard rumors. This is kind of strange, but I'll just pass it on. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying it's a rumor. Angela Merkel is trying to be dismissed from her current chancellor position, which is like their president, prime minister of Germany. She's trying to see a nice transition. The trouble is she doesn't speak English. But, you know, neither does, neither does the, the recent African leader uh, of the UN. I mean, I don't know that you've got to be a real strong English-speaking uh, secretary general. All you really need to do is, is be a little bit dishonest in order to follow through on the UN global takeover plan, which I don't want to get into. All right, watch Frankfurt eclipse London. London is always expecting, oh, we're going to be the primary hub for the RMB trade. Really? Uh, do you have corporate interests behind those RMB trades? Well, we're still going to be the biggest. Well, you watch Frankfurt trot out their connections with the businesses that are doing business in China and Russia, and that will be the big advantage lever. All right, enough of Germany. I think they're going to flip, and when it flips, there are going to be a lot of countries that follow, like France. Watch the pigs follow whatever Germany does, but with a lot of difficulty. All right, Turkey is the next swing state. They're the historical fence sitter. You can look back a thousand years and still see, well, they got significant European ties, like, you know, the Ottoman Empire, uh, Budapest. Budapest is in Hungary. Some influence. My Buddha. That's Budapest. Okay, Turkey's got this gold intermediary function, and, and they're not going to give it up. What happened after the Iran sanctions by the U.S., U.K., and E.U., following like, like a, a French poodle uh, in subservience, what you had was the Turks acting as intermediary for the Indians to buy Iranian oil. There's your three-way triangle. India bought Iran's oil and gas and paid for it, two Tehran private banks in gold that they bought in Turkey. 
And that worked around because the, the dumbasses in the U.S. government who set up the Iran sanctions, which was stupid to begin with, just, just forgot to include private Iranian banks in the sanctions. So India used private Iranian banks as intermediaries. I mean, golly, we are just so full of stupid U.S. government leadership, which I believe has treason as its business card. Okay, it's important for the dollar alternative, what I call the trade settlement prototype in gold. Turkey's important for that. It's the most important country for gold trade in the entire Muslim Arab region. The, the shipment of gold to Dubai in the United Arab Emirates is enormous. And from enormous. So they've already got one foot, Turkey does, in the east, and one foot in the west. They're the toll taker. They, 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 they take the fees at the bridge. They control the Bosporus Straits. Right now, they're making important energy deals with Russia. I don't mean just for supply. I'm talking about things like you know pipelines and enormous storage facilities for gas. Not, not LNG so much, but gas facilities. But in addition to that, generating plants for electricity in Turkey done by Russian contractors. You think Turkey's going to follow through on sanctions against Russia? <laughs> I don't think so. This is how stupid the U.S. government policy is and destined to fail. So you've got also the Turkish uh, in Cyrillic Air Force Base, the NATO Air Force Base. That's the primary first stop for U.S. heroin coming out of Afghanistan. So you think the Turks are going to stop the heroin running? I don't think so. The third nation... Let's get out of that topic quickly. The third nation is Saudi Arabia. This is already a done deal. The divorce is done. It's over with. The papers have been signed, or at least they're, well, I think they're almost to be signed, or the ink is still wet. The Saudis have had their divorce with the United States. In, in I think it was early April or late March, the gay prince, I'm sorry, President Obama, um, to Riyadh for a summit meeting. And it had all kinds of little State Department uh, pamphlets and online, uh, oh, look at this, the United States is going to meet with uh, the, the royals of Saudi Arabia and just assure that relations are strong. Okay, well, they had to tear up all the pamphlets, gather them all up, and pretend the meeting didn't exist because the summit meeting lasted 20 minutes. So what did King Abdullah tell Obama? What did Obama try to tell Abdullah? My guess is they had a lot of arguments over things like, continued treasury bond support over things like continued terrorism across the Arab region, including, say, Lebanon and Syria. My guess is they had a lot of arguments about Saudi Arabia wanting detente with Iran. Okay, so you get the idea. There's another news item that came out last month that a new crown prince has been designated among the Saudi royals, and it's not the Prince Bandar line. It's not the U.S.-U.K. favorable line. So what you're seeing now is the Saudis line up their, their heirs to the throne that are favorable to the East, not to the West. This is dead petrodollar events. These are signposts that are in snow, except for the American and British analysts who are paid not to look that way. Most likely, my guess, is that China ordered the Saudis and the Iranians to make peace, engage in detente, stop the violence, quit funding the, the U.S.-sponsored al-Qaeda uh, terrorism. Al-Qaeda is spelled A-L hyphen, C-I-A hyphen, D-A. Wake up. So my guess is we're going to soon see the Saudis are going to make a very big announcement, and I believe it's going to be part of Chinese requirements to accept any payment for Saudi oil shipments in a major currency, any major currency, British pounds, euros, Swiss franc, Japanese yen, that doesn't matter, as long as the major currency. They don't want Thai baht, okay? They might take South Korean yuan, I don't know, maybe the South Koreans will gather up some, some Japanese yen to pay. But we're going to see the Saudis and the petrodollar with a formal announcement that they'll accept any major currency. Watch all the OPEC nations follow, like Nigeria, and the entire Persian Gulf nations, like, you know, like Ku Kuwait, uh, Oman, lots of different countries, they're going to take non-dollars. At the same time, watch OPEC completely lose its, uh, its steam, its influence, are 
in, in the next month, I believe. And the meeting has to do with all the different major natural gas exporting nations. Well, gee, that kind of sounds like the OPEC, oil producing export nations, export countries. But we're going to see the natural gas co-op that's dominated by Gazprom and Russia. And I think the key major support will be from Iran, which I read an astonishing figure that over 30%, maybe as much as 35% of global gas reserves are under Iran control. Wow. Okay, Qatar is a major center for Arab gas and LNG. Well, they're inviting Gazprom into their camp right now for technology transfer. They're trying to get some you know, new construction and new agreements for LNG port facilities. They're not easy to make. Okay, so the Saudis, I think it's a done deal. They've already flipped. You just won't read about it in the controlled U.S. press. The fourth nation is much more high risk, and that's Japan. I don't want to get into the attack on Fukushima. Uh, we call it a natural incident in the West because our press writes the press reports. But in the East, in Russia, in China, and Japan, they called it an attack. They called it an attack. They called it an attack. Very clear language. Attack. Okay? Fukushima was an attack. Japan, therefore, has to be very careful. They're courting right now Russia. They've got a cr large crew of Russian engineers working on pipelines and LNG facilities without visas. And their, their project is to connect up with the continent, with Korea. Okay, so watch North Korea. I don't want to get into North Korea and how strange they are in any succession or rumors of, a, of, a, of a, an unusual death by their little queer leader. But uh, something's going on with Korea. Watch them link up with China and Russia with the pipelines. So, like we had the backfire in the Iran sanctions, we're having the backfire in the Fukushima attacks because Japan is now working with Russia through the Chinese landmass with Gazprom and Rosneft energy pipelines. The whole Northeast Pacific is a major development zone now. The Sea of Okhotsk uh, is under Russian development. Uh, we're also seeing the Siberian coast develop its LNG facilities. You know, it's kind of interesting. If you're in the frozen northeast of Siberia, you don't need to, to, to freeze much. For so we're going to see Japan and Korea join up, work out these commercial deals. So the U.S. is going to work the political and military angle, and the Japanese and Koreans, they're going to work the commercial angle. They're going to jump from the western fold into the Eurasian trade zone. <clears throat> so watch these swing states. I think Japan is not a done deal so much because their, their prime minister, this Abe, Abe, A-B-E, he's, he's nothing but an American tool who has really angered all the major political elements and banking elements and commercial elements in Japan. I, I don't see his term uh, it's not so much a term. A prime minister really has coalition support. Watch him lose his coalition support in Japan real soon, John. Yeah, we'll definitely keep our eye out for Abe losing his coalition support. And obviously those are major, major events to have those uh, four nations uh, swing away from U.S. alliance and towards the east. The U.S. economy, Jim, it appears to be accelerating in its uh, recession, um, really uh, never ended uh, the recession uh, well, st statistically, uh, in the U.S. press, it did, but in all practical, in all practicality, it really never ended. And uh, we appear to be accelerating into a, a new dip or a new decline. The housing market's rolling over again here in the U.S. Uh, what's happening in the U.S. economy, in your view? Well, first of all, I pay no attention to the NBER and their politically driven pronouncements of uh, recession or no recession. When I was in graduate school at Carnegie Mellon, the chairman of my department was actually a key consultant for the NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research. And, and I, I was told then, Jim, this is the most prestigious economic think tank in the United States. It's got some Boston roots, and uh, it, it's really competent. And what I've learned over the years is, no, it's not competent. No, it's not. They take marching orders. So I really wonder if my old department chairman was part of justifying uh, false policy and, and false conditions, or, or whether he was really bothered by it all, but continued with his lucrative consulting work. You have to factor in the 4 to 5 percent standard lie. What I mean by that is, what is 
the price inflation in the United States. Well, I follow accurate calculations by John Williams at the Shadow Government Statistics Group. He now has declared and measured that the give or take. Okay, so if the United States government tells me that it's one and a half, let's just call it one or two, then what's the lie? It's four or five percent. So they're calling price inflation on the nominal gross domestic product. By that I mean just add up all the numbers without any adjustment for inflation. Just what are the raw nominal numbers? They're calling the growth and the raw nominal numbers are calling it growth. They're calling it economic growth. It's not economic growth. They're calling inflation economic growth. So now even with their four to five percent lie, we've got a, a recession in the first quarter of something on the order of one percent. I don't know if it's one and a quarter, three quarters of a percent. I don't give a crap because I don't pay much attention to their, their stinking lies and propaganda because what I, I don't care what they claim their deflator is. What they need to deflate is the hot air propaganda coming out of their stinking mouths. You've got the retail sector that's actually in a free fall. I mean, I, I pulled out an article recently and it had 20 different retail chain type firms, all of them. In, in negative territory, in, in you know what they call comp sales. What's our sales like this quarter versus distance? I'm sorry, last year's same quarter for stores that were in existence a year ago. So we can make a, a like kind comparison. Store X in New York a year ago, that first quarter versus Store X this year, first quarter. It's called comp sales, comparable sales. Well, that's a very important uh, measuring stick. Uh, we, we use it all the time when I was at Staples for five years in the late 90s. All right, so you're, you're getting this free fall in retail. And, and you know, people like to say, well, retail drives the economy. <clears throat> no, no, it doesn't. Retail and consumption does not drive the U.S. economy. It's the backwards thinking for the propaganda artists who want you to think that way. When you're doing home equity pullouts five years ago, eight years ago, so that you can go on vacation or go to school or pay your bills, that's burning your furniture. That's not driving an economy. That's converting your capital into spending cash, spendable cash, what they call discretionary income. It's not even discretionary income. It's discretionary spendable funds. Okay, that's not driving an economy. What we're seeing now is some stark, ugly, extreme evidence in two forms. And I put out a public article somewhere around two months ago where I showed the money supply going from $800 billion in the year 2008 to four the recent calculation, which is a six-year jump five-fold. Gee, did, did that not kick-start the economy? Did that not provide stimulus for the economy? No, no, it's evidence of systemic failure. What's the flip side? Where did all the money go and how fast is it moving? Well, you look at the money velocity measure, and it's way down in the last seven years. It's gone from a 2.03 times versus a 1.75 times now. So since 2007 to now, seven years, not quite full years, you've got a 25% a reduction in money velocity. And just to substantiate that, Jim, usually if you're in a recovery, the velocity will pick back up as the economic activity picks back up. And we haven't seen that since 2008. It's continued to decline, and M2 uh, velocity, I think, is at 20-year lows right now. Yes, it is. And, and what, why is that? It's because the money that's being shoved into the system is for Wall Street bailouts. It's for coverage of derivative failures. It's for covering and redeeming Wall Street bonds, making it sound like stimulus for the economy, yet it's money denied to the mainstream. And you even look at the major banks, and they've hard, made harder, harder their uh, approval process for, say, bank loans by a company. Oh, no, no, you don't have sufficient collateral for that. And sorry, but you don't have good performance in your company for the last six months. You're not a good credit risk. So what is a good credit risk? The dead, hollow, reed, insolvent big banks. Those are great credit risks, even though they're all dead. So what you're seeing is a five-fold increase in the money supply and a 25% decrease in the money velocity. What adds to the slowdown? What makes slower, I should say, the slowdown in money velocity but low interest rates? All the savers out there outnumber 
all the people on consumer loans. That's the funny little fact of life. It's 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 like half half is it's it's like fifty percent larger, seventy percent larger. The volume of CDs of savers, the the amount of money put into the system looking for a yield on savings is 50 to 70 percent larger than the amount of money on consumer loans. So we like to talk about the stimulus of cheaper car loans, uh, of cheaper mortgages. Well, gee, we're down to under 4 percent for the adjustable rate mortgage and the 30-year mortgage, but is that stimulating the housing market? No. Why? Because we've got all these different negative influences. I, I have been that professional economists don't notice that 0% interest and QE with unsterilized bond monetization is a deadweight millstone wet blanket on the U.S. economy, slowing the system down, raising the cost structure, vanishing the profit margin, and killing capital by forcing it into retired status. If you've got a small business or a big, biz a big company's uh, business unit, business segment, sometimes they call it, and it's, it's lost its profit margin, from higher costs, well, what happens? Well, you shut it down, you take the widget machines offline, you put them in a warehouse, you take all the computers, and you move in into other businesses, or you liquidate them, you find a liquidator that, that gives you 70 cents on the dollar or 60 cents on the dollar for your equipment, and you retire the capital. The end result of ZERP and QE is capital destruction. Wake up, you PhD economists, you're idiots, you're morons. You're harlots for Wall Street. You're spokesmen for the U.S. government. I'm not even a Ph.D. economist. I'm a statistics Ph.D. And I like to say in my bio, unencumbered by the limitations of economics credentials. Why is it that I have correct forecasts and these Ph.D. economists don't? Why is it that I see the capital destruction and the Ph.D. economists don't? I'm going to say it's because you're paid by uh, subscribers who uh, want access to real data rather than um, the big banks and those who want to market. Exactly. Exactly. I'm paid to notice what's really going on. I'm not a Wall Street harlot, and I'm not a government spokesman. So we're, we're not seeing the policy work. And, you know, the sad tragedy of it all is if QE doesn't work, do QE too. If that doesn't work, do Operation Twist and confuse people. Then if that doesn't work, do QE3. And if your taper talk fails, continue with it anyway and just lie. Continue with Q3 and lie and use the Belgian bulge. So we're not seeing success from policy, and you've got to question, well, what is their objective? My, my understanding of their objective is to crash the economy and institute global fascism. I mean, gosh, you had Joe Biden at the Air Force Academy giving a uh, commencement speech just a few days ago, and he was very open about it. He said, the U.S. is the leading nation to enforce the new world order. I, I never like to get into NWO conversations, but gosh, our vice president did, and no one even criticized him. Gee, is, is this the Jack Boots and Gestapo talking? I, I think it probably is. All right, there, there, there's a Obamacare. Is that intended to help the U.S. economy? I don't think so. So what's the effect of Obamacare? Well, companies, large and small, are taking all their marginal employees and making them part-time so they don't have to pay into it. And they're also laying people off. So, gosh, I think Obamacare killed some jobs. Way to go, Obama. Uh, gee, when you were at Columbia, <coughs> bullshit, <coughs> did you take any economics courses? No one saw you on campus, so where were you? Uh, now, we, we've got these Manchurian candidates and uh, narco princes parading around as leaders you got Jimmy Carter, half-brother of the Kennedys, parading as president, who continued with uh, a lot of the states, State Department policy in the Middle East with Kissinger, who was basically a Rockefeller agent. Uh, you've got Clinton, bastard grandson of the Rockefellers, parading as president, finally got impeached over stains on a dress, and how do you define the word is? I mean, gosh, our, our leadership has become a stinking joke. It's, it's a joke, and they're not working toward the Constitution. They uh, enabled its shredding with the Patriot Act. 9-11 uh, was a coup d'etat. Building 7 had all kinds of J.P. Morgan. Building 7, never hit by an airplane. Gee, structural sympathy? 
may it fall. My joke with structural sympathy regarding the third building in World Trade is, I've felled only a few trees in my life with a chainsaw. <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do. You've got to throw a rope over an upper branch and, and pull hard on it to make sure you control its fall. <clears throat> but I had a, a smart friend, and, uh, you know, if, if structural sympathy, sympathy were the case, you could cut down three or four trees in a forest, and a couple of the other ones would fall in sympathy. It just doesn't happen that way. So, wake up in the United States. 10% uh, I think is awake, and I give them a lot of credit. They're buying gold. They don't buy the 9-11 garbage story. The architects and engineers have their AE-1000 group. We're starting to see more and more information now come out. It's coming from the east. It's coming from the Snowden file source. About 9-11, what, what was it all about? I hope they come up with some evidence about what Oklahoma City was all about. Because that has Fannie Mae trails to it. Now, we've got a, a nation that's pretty much been taken over, John, and uh, they're trying to crash the system. They're, they're going to increase QE, and they're going to lie better about it. They're going to continue with the bond monetization. They're not going to sterilize anything. They're trying to convince us that they're going to do more sterilization as they buy new bonds with printed money, they're not going to do that. They're going to continue using the, uh, the proxies and exchange stabilization fund and, the, and, and what Rob Kirby likes to call the artificial demand through the interest rate swap, swap derivatives uh, with leverage of 50 to 1. They can create bond demand, and they've created some bond rallies that were totally artificial in nature. So a lot of weird things going on, and I, I think people need to uh, wake up to the reality of th that we've pretty much lost our, our nation for its leadership, and it's going to be very difficult to take back. I think we're, we're more likely to be reindustrialized with Chinese masters, and, and the United States is going to lose its dollar credit card in the process of the Eurasian trade zone coming, coming into being. They're going to have gold-backed currencies. They're going to have a, a, a stepping stone of fully convertible yuan currency, and then later a gold-backed yuan currency. Both China and Russia, they, 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 I say each, each of China and Russia, they each have over 20,000 tons of gold. Uh, I mean, these official numbers are as stupid and, and full of lies as the U.S. has, you know, economic growth. The Chinese have decided long ago, we're going to play your game of lies, and, and we, we're going to tell you that we have 1,000 tons of gold when we've got, you know, closer to 15 to 20,000. There's no need to tell the Americans the truth on gold ownership. Just, just follow through with the Eurasian trade zone. Forcing device. We're getting into some key turning point events. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were pointing to mid-April as a key currency reset event. And, you know, I kept telling people, well, you know, they might be working toward that, but watch delay upon delay upon delay. Now we're hearing mid-July as a key turning point event for currency resets and, you know, dollar policy. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be a, a very strange mix of disruptive events. And I don't have all the answers, but I, I do have, a, I think, a, a keen sense of a lot of the trails and uh, I don't pay any attention to mainstream news. I, I hardly ever watch it anymore. I'm, I'm, I have a strange phenomenon going on with me, John. I, I wake up in the morning, I do some work, and I do some errands and whatever, do some more reading of emails, and I struggle. What day is it? The market's open? I, I don't even care. What day is it? I often think it's Saturday because I don't turn on CNBC or Bloomberg News. I often think it's Saturday. I think it's Saturday right now. <laughs> it's not. It, it's what? It, it's, it's, uh, it, it's Thursday, right? No, no it's Tuesday. <laughs> I'm losing track. I'm losing my orientation because of all the corrupt market activity, because of all the propaganda and lies. I mean, I got I got some informed American friends. I should say intelligent American friends who think that Russia attacked Ukraine. I mean, they're just clueless. Well, Jim, we've covered a lot of big, big, critical, and important topics today, uh, from the, the Gazprom 300 uh, what 300 billion dollar deal uh, a couple of weeks ago, and the implications on that to the, the Belgian bulge of U.S. Treasury bonds and uh, your theory that it could be uh, the BRICS sourcing of gold reserves for a new coming central bank as, uh, as well as uh, your prediction of the, the big swing states uh, swinging away from the U.S. Um, to the east and the big swing states being uh, Germany, France, uh, Japan, and the Saudis. And that in my mind is probably the one of the most monumental uh, predictions you've ever made. And if um, if we do see that happen, it's going to have profound implications on the U.S. dollar and the U.S. economy um, and the reserve status of the dollar, obviously, as um, if some of the largest Western economies, particularly Germany and uh, Japan, shift away from uh, U.S. alliance and move to the east. Um, 
So uh, I think we'll wrap things up there. Uh, we'll let listeners, uh, we've given them an hour already. We'll let them listen to that uh, two or three times to let everything sink in uh, if they want. Um, but before we let you go, um, if you could let the listeners know a little bit more about uh, where to find um, your regular work uh, besides the, the public hat trick articles, of course, which are going to be read on Silver Doctors, where do they find your subscription reports? Well, the, the website, goldenjackass.com, it's got a free public domain area where I, I have a web page full of uh, interviews like this and public articles. They're, the public articles are, are meant to inform and, and try to instruct to some degree, but to be honest, uh, I regard them as not so successful if they don't result in new orders placed for my newsletter. I'm, I'm in a business running the Hat Trick Letter newsletter. So my public articles are they're functional, and, and I, I appreciate compliments from people about them, but they're shameless promotional pieces to try to gather more clients. And uh, that, that's fine. I, I don't mind if people never sign up and, and read uh, the public articles if they awaken to what's going on. So I've got the public area. But then there's the hat trick letter. It consists of two different monthly reports that come out each month. It's the Money War report for high level incidents, events, factors, and the Gold and Currency report, which is for ground level incidents, factors, and, and lots of different things like, you know, coin demand. Uh, I, I quote some things from your, your website on, on silver coin demand from the United States. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on at the high level, which is a war to preserve the dollar regime in place with its satellite of paper currency. But then there's a ground level battle. It's mostly with demand and, and movement away from the dollar for trade usage. And, and I cover that with the Golden Currency Report. So those two reports cover a lot of material. And I, there's so much going on that in the last month, John, I had two special reports. I mean, it's incredible what's going on. Uh, I had a special report on just the military angle for NATO and contractors doing business with, with Russia and China. Europe has contractors doing business with Europe and China, um, with Russia and China. They're not going to sanction to get rid of their own business. I had another special report on the collapse of the U.S. economy called Dead Man Walking. That was my second uh, special report for the month. So a lot is going on. It's, it's overwhelming what's going on. And my biggest decisions when I write the newsletter is what do I – not include because I can't cover it all. So I, I, I try to rotate topics. So it's all very interesting and very difficult, but I'm glad for my background in marketing research, which was uh, you know, multi-dimensional analysis. This is difficult. And I don't buy into the propaganda for my work. I don't buy into the, the BS coming out of the government. I don't assume there's a recovery. I don't assume that Wall Street acts in your best interest. I, I look to see where's their crime. Where's their fraud? Where's their cover-up? And, you know, the banker murders are part of their cover And the banker murders is covering up the London Whale, J.P. Morgan, interest rate derivative loss of over $100 billion. They don't want that information to get out. So they kill people. It's sad. It's sad what's going on. We're, we're losing our key you know, cradle of capitalism and beacon of freedom. When that happens, you're going to see the United States very isolated. I mean, talk about isolation in the last couple of years. That's been a pretty important theme of mine, how the U.S. will exert pressure, say, with Iran sanctions. And before you know it, a couple of European nations break away and say, well, we're going to continue dealing with Iran. Before you know it, you've got the United States making so many rules that no one wants to play with them anymore. They were isolated before World War I. They're going to be isolated again as the fascist nation. So what are the four nations? It's Germany, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Japan. Okay, in order, let's just follow this. Germany has significant technology. The Eurasian trade zone, let's just think it's, it's China and Russia and a lot of other nations. They're going to want the technology transfer from Germany. If you look at construction equipment in China, you see some Japanese, but you see a lot of German. I mean, that, that device that, that sucks up cement and drops it on the seventh floor, that sucking machine that deposits cement, that's German. They get the lock on that market. They have the lock on a lot of things. Obviously not cranes. A lot of countries make cranes. But we're going to see Germany important for investment capital. Watch Frankfurt explode as a an RMB hub, uh, that term is coming up a lot. It means renminbi hub. It means a hub for trading bonds and issuing bonds and converting currency from the Chinese yuan denomination. So it's the RMB hub. 
Watch a lot of the business connections with Russia and China. I think we're going to see uh, the importance of the 3,000 German companies doing question. If 3,000 German companies are doing business in Russia, will Germany follow through on a sanctions? <laughs> I mean, what a stupid concept. Germany is not going to follow through on any sanctions with Russia. 40% of the natural gas used by Germany comes from Russia. 30% of all the crude oil used in Germany comes from Russia. You think they're going to sanction their own energy suppliers? What a stupid concept. No, Germany already has strong commercial ties with Russia and extremely firm but newer ties with China. They're going to flip, and what I've been told is that Angela Merkel, because the summit meeting lasted 20 minutes. So what did King Abdullah tell Obama? What did Obama try to tell Abdullah? My guess is they had a lot of arguments over things like continued treasury bond support, over things like continued terrorism across the Arab region, including, say, Lebanon and Syria. My guess is they had a lot of arguments about Saudi Arabia wanting detente with Iran. Okay, so you get the idea. There's another news item that came out last month that a new crown prince has been designated among the Saudi royals, and it's not the Prince Bandar line. It's not the U.S.-U.K. favorable line. So what you're seeing now is the Saudis line up their, their heirs to the throne that are favorable to the east, not to the west. This is dead petrodollar events. These are signposts that are in snow, except for the American and British analysts who are paid not to look that way. Most likely, my guess, is that China ordered the Saudis and the Iranians to make peace, engage in detente, stop the violence, quit funding the, the U.S.-sponsored al-Qaeda uh, terrorism. Al-Qaeda is spelled A-L hyphen, C-I-A hyphen, D-A, wake up. So my guess is we're going to soon see the Saudis are going to make a very big announcement, and I believe it's going to be part of Chinese requirements to accept any payment for Saudi oil shipments in a major currency, any major currency, British pounds, euros, Swiss franc, Japanese yen, that doesn't matter, as long as the major currency. They don't want Thai bot, okay? They might take South Korean yuan, I don't know. Maybe the South Koreans will gather up some, some Japanese yen to pay. But we're going to see the Saudis and the petrodollar with a formal announcement that they'll accept any major currency. Watch all the OPEC nations follow, like Nigeria and the entire Persian Gulf nations, like, you know, like Ku Kuwait, uh, Oman, lots of different countries. They're going to take non-dollars. At the same time, watch OPEC completely lose its, uh, its steam, its influence in, in the next month, I believe. And the meeting has to do with all the different major natural gas exporting nations because the, the dumbasses in the U.S. government who set up the Iran sanctions, which was stupid to begin with, just, just forgot to include private Iranian banks in the sanctions. So India used private... Iranian banks as intermediaries. I mean, golly, we are just so full of stupid U.S. government leadership, which I believe has treason as its business card. Okay, it's important for the dollar alternative, what I call the trade settlement prototype in gold. Turkey is important for that. It's the most important country for gold trade in the entire Muslim Arab region. The, the shipment of gold to Dubai in the United Arab Emirates is enormous. And from enormous. So they've already got one foot, Turkey does, in the east, and one foot in the west. They're the toll taker. The, they, they, they take the fees at the bridge. They control the Bosphorus Straits. Right now they're making important energy deals with Russia. I don't mean just for supply. I'm talking about things like you know pipelines and enormous storage facilities for gas. Not, not LNG so much, but gas facilities. But in addition to that, generating plants for electricity in Turkey done by Russian contractors. You think Turkey is going to follow through on sanctions against Russia? <laughs> I don't think so. This is how stupid the U.S. government policy is and destined to fail. So you've got also the Turkish 
uh, in Cyrillic Air Force Base, the NATO Air Force Base. That's the primary first stop for U.S. heroin coming out of Afghanistan. So, do you think the Turks are going to stop the heroin running? I don't think so. The third nation, let's get out of that topic quickly, the third nation is Saudi Arabia. This is already a done deal. The divorce is done. It's over with. The papers have been signed, or at least they're, well, I think they're almost to be signed, or the ink is still wet. The Saudis have had their divorce with the United States. In, in I think it was early April or late March, the gay prince, I'm sorry, President Obama, um, to Riyadh for a summit meeting. And it had all kinds of little State Department uh, pamphlets and online, uh, oh, look at this, the United States is going to meet with uh, the, the royals of Saudi Arabia and just assure that relations are strong. Okay, well, they had to tear up all the pamphlets, gather them all up, and pretend the meeting didn't exist, even though she was just reelected. She's been told, you're on the way out. You just don't represent us anymore. You want to continue to sing in total harmony with the U.S., E.U., U.K., banker, cabal, then fine, because you don't sing in harmony with our corporate sector here in Germany. I've heard rumors. This is kind of strange, but I'll just pass it on. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying it's a rumor. Angela Merkel is trying to be dismissed from her current chancellor position, which is like their president, prime minister of Germany. She's trying to see a nice transition. The trouble is she doesn't speak English. But, you know, neither does, neither does the, the recent African leader uh, of the UN. I mean, I don't know that you've got to be a real strong English-speaking uh, secretary general. All you really need to do is, is be a little bit dishonest in order to follow through on the UN global takeover plan, which I don't want to get into. All right, watch Frankfurt eclipse London. London is always expecting, oh, we're going to be the primary hub for the RMB trade. Really? Uh, do you have corporate interests behind those RMB trades? Well, we're still going to be the biggest. Well, you watch Frankfurt trot out their connections with the businesses that are doing business in China and Russia, and that'll be the big advantage lever. All right, enough of Germany. I think they're going to flip, and when it flips, there are going to be a lot of countries that follow, like France. Watch the pigs follow whatever Germany does, but with a lot of difficulty. All right, Turkey is the next swing state. They're the historical fence sitter. You can look back a thousand years and still see, well, they got significant European ties, like, you know, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Budapest. Budapest is in Hungary. Some influence. My Buddha. That's Budapest. Okay, Turkey's got this gold intermediary function, and, and they're not going to give it up. What happened after the Iran sanctions by the U.S., U.K., and E.U., following like, like a, a French poodle uh, in subservience, what you had was the Turks acting as intermediary for the Indians to buy Iranian oil. There's your three-way triangle. India bought Iran's oil and gas and paid for it, two Tehran private banks in gold that they bought in Turkey. And that worked around. Well, gee, that kind of sounds like the OPEC, oil-producing export nations, export countries. But we're going to see the natural gas co-op that's dominated by Gazprom and Russia. And I think the key major support will be from Iran, which I read an astonishing figure that over 30%, maybe as much as 35% of global gas reserves are under Iran control. Wow. Okay, Qatar is a major center for Arab gas and LNG. Well, they're inviting Gazprom into their camp right now for technology transfer. They're trying to get some you know, new construction and new agreements for LNG port facilities. They're not easy to make. Okay, so the Saudis, I think it's a done deal. They've already flipped. You just won't read about it in the controlled U.S. press. The fourth nation is much more high risk, and that's Japan. I don't want to get into the attack on Fukushima. Uh, we call it a natural incident in the West because our press writes the press reports. But in the East, in Russia, in China, in Japan, they called it an attack. They called it an attack. They called it an attack. Very clear language. Attack. Okay? Fukushima was an attack. Japan, therefore, has to be very careful. They're courting right now Russia. They've got a cr large crew of Russian engineers working on pipelines and LNG facilities without visas. And their, their project is to connect up with the continent, with 
Korea. Okay, so watch North Korea. I don't want to get into North Korea and how strange they are in any succession or rumors of, a, of, a, of a, an unusual death by their little queer leader. But uh, something's going on with Korea. Watch them link up with China and Russia with the pipelines. So, like we had the backfire in the Iran sanctions, we're having the backfire in the Fukushima attacks because Japan is now working with Russia through the Chinese landmass with Gazprom and Rosneft energy pipelines. The whole Northeast Pacific is a major development zone now. The Sea of Okhotsk uh, is under Russian development. Uh, we're also seeing the Siberian coast develop its LNG facilities. You know, it's kind of interesting if you're in the frozen northeast of Siberia.